Alison Seeley Smith here, the voice of Storm from X-Men the Animated Series and X-Men 97. I'm summoning you to a monumental gathering, the Uncanny Experience, the immersive X-Men fandom convention. This September 28th and 29th, we are transforming the Minneapolis Club in Minnesota into the hallowed halls of the Xavier Institute. Prepare for an electrifying array of panels, a mutant marketplace, celebrity meet and greets, a cosplay contest, the enigmatic Hellfire Club, and an unforgettable after-party in the mansion. Embrace your powers and let the storm guide you. Visit theuncannyexperience.com to learn more. Bum bum bottom, 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 bum bum bott
And th I think that's what matters, right? I also went to the DC Docs Fest in Washington, DC uh, for the premiere of Superman, the Christopher Reeve story. Yes, which, how was that? Oh, I mean, it was fantastic and also a great way to celebrate Father's Day, you know, uh, because I mean, he's a complicated father. As his daughter, Alexandra Reeve Givens would attest to, she was there as well. Afterward, there was a little Q&A with Audi Cornish for her podcast, and they were talking about, you know, like her parents never got married. Uh, you know, during the Superman production, Christopher Reeve met Gay Exton, fell madly in love. They had a couple kids. They never got married. But at some point, Christopher Reeve felt like he needed to get away. And he basically just left them. Oh, no. And went on and became very much a playboy. And it's all documented thoroughly in the Superman doc. Uh, and eventually he met Dana and they married and had another son. And then Christopher Reeve had his accident in 1995, which left him paralyzed and the, the the documentary, the primary focus of the documentary is how Reeve found the purpose to continue living in that horrible condition and how he used his experience to become a champion for others. And in the process of that, really connecting with his family and appreciating and falling back in love with his entire family. And it was only after the accident that he truly understood heroism and what it meant to be a Superman. And I found the film to be beyond moving. You know, I, I, it really is a comic book couples counseling documentary. While the Reeve family and the Reeve estate gave the filmmakers their blessing, they had no access to the movie. So they did all the interviews, they gave over all their archival footage, their home movies, and then they didn't see the film until it was completed. So it was a tremendous act of faith. And thankfully the family does like the film and are okay with the more complicated and prickly aspects of Christopher Reeve's narrative being out there. I think that's so important though, because I, I sometimes feel like when you like overly sanitize the story of a person's life. Which happens more often than not. It makes it look like for that person, for the subject of the documentary, being good was easy. And mm. being good is never easy. Mm -hmm. We are mm -hmm. always fighting against the demons of our true nature, against our own selfishness, uh, against our own distractions for other more worldly endeavors, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I mean, we just watched the Beach Boys documentary on Disney+, Plus, which we both enjoyed, but that film, really only gives you like a surface level idea of what Brian Wilson was going through. You might and even say it surfed <laughs> on the surface. I shouldn't have stopped yikes, you. That was, yikes, a, that was a bad. Uh, but also it doesn't touch upon the very sad and tragic death of Dennis Wilson. Right. And it just feels like it's like missing. Yeah. Yeah. It, it feels incomplete and it feels like it does a disservice to these incredible lives that they're trying to communicate to the viewer, right? So the Superman, the Christopher Reeve story documentary doesn't come out until the fall, but I hope everyone listening to this podcast has Myself it included. on their radar. Yes, please. The other weird thing I want to mention is that I saw this film next to a gentleman who was wearing a really nice suit. Oh no, it yeah, was like you're gonna completely tell the story. blue and yeah. he had a red tie. And I asked him, oh, are you, are you, you're wearing your suit. You, you, you match the suit to the Superman colors. He's like, yeah, of course. And we talked a little bit about uh, Christopher Reeve and Superman and our love for both. Uh, and then afterwards, you know, I went onto Twitter to see who was talking about this event, the DC docs event. And I, I saw this gentleman's Twitter feed and I clicked on it and, and I saw it was like full of Steve Bannon yeah. and Tucker Carlson. Yikes. And like, I'm just like, hold on, hold on, hold on. The guy who loves Superman and Christopher Reeve and, and, and this incredible story, like there's this moment in the documentary where Christopher Reeve is addressing, you know, post accident, the DNC. And he's talking about how like Americans do not leave the needy hanging. Right. You know, Americans help their needy. And then this guy, he watches all this and he admires all of this. And then he has like this 
Tucker Carlson fee? Yeah, he's like, yeah, but no universal health care. We don't want to take care of that. It, it, just, it just shows that we all watch and consume media in very different ways, right. and we get very different ideas out of the same stuff. I don't know. How, I don't know how we can see eye to eye, but uh, with Superman and Christopher Reeve. But there you go. Just to put a button on the Father's Day thing. When we celebrate Christopher Reeve, for example, we don't celebrate the person that he was every single day and every single choice that he ever made. But we do take the time to recognize the good that he did choose to do. And we also recognize what an uphill battle that can be some of the time. And I, and I think like not every person who has biologically contributed to a person being on this earth necessarily deserves to have a day. Uh, yeah. You know what I mean? Sure. But when you take the time to recognize the choices that your father or your parent or your parental figure who has stepped into your life, like I think that that's a truly beautiful thing. And actually the less stringent we are about what counts, the more beautiful the celebration can be. Mm, say more. So what's in the forefront of my mind today is we are watching the new season of Master Chef. Uh, uh, and this yeah. season, it's so exciting. Oh. It is Gen Z versus Gen X versus Millennials. Go Millennials. Go Gen X. Versus Boomers. <laughs> and on the Boomer episode, yeah. there was this auditionee yeah. named Christopher. And he's a Boomer. He's 59 years old. He's a half Japanese gentleman. And you're allowed to bring like your friends and family to watch you audition. Yeah, to cheer you on. And he brought this octogenarian. And when Gordon Ramsay or whoever asked who this man was, he said that he didn't know who his father was. So he contributed his DNA to one of those databases. And through that database, he got reconnected with his biological father. Who's this guy? Right. Who had impregnated his mother during World War II. And what I thought was so beautiful about that is not only did he get to celebrate reconnecting with this part of his family, but he talked about how important it was to have his dad there. And yeah. he used the word dad. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I think in so many other contexts, this 60-year-old would look at this 80-year-old, and there would be respect there, but they would be kind of peers. Right. Well, yeah, yeah. And like, you know by, what I mean? Like, They're I both mean, two adults. Even, They're two adult men. If you look at even our relationship with our parents now, it's very different from when we were little kids. Right. right? No, that's what I'm saying, Yeah, I know. Though. I know. The idea that this man would meet someone in his 60s and go like, hey, now this guy has come into my life and I am going to call this person dad. Yeah. I think that is so, and the fact that it's like that vacancy or this kind of vacancy, he might've had some other father figure, but like that vacancy that was in his heart is now filled. Yeah, you could and see all that. You yeah, could see like- Yeah, it was just like so beautiful. And I just love the idea of like, hey, you know, you choose your family, you know? Like, you know, what? I choose my father every day. I love him so much. I respect how he raised me. We don't see eye to eye on everything, but we don't talk about it. That's how my family operates. <laughs> but like, you know, like the idea of going like, hey, dude, you can be my dad. Yeah, yeah. I just, I think it's just yeah. so awesome. Yeah, it, that was great. And it's such a great moment and it's so brief, but in those few moments on MasterChef, you see so much life. Yeah. I loved it so much. Great, great poll, Lisa. I love how you brought it into this episode. So use Happy Father's Day as radically as you want. Yeah. Just go out of your way. Yeah, I, we're so- ex It's in the past, but next year. You, can, you have a whole year to plan practice. We're so excited about this episode to have Sean Phillips and Jacob Phillips in conversation talking about their unique collaboration, which basically began with the criminal novella, My Heroes Have Always Been Junkies. Uh, Sean Phillips had planned to color that book himself, but discovered that he did not have the time to color it. So why not ask my artistic son, Jacob, to do the job? And, you know, since that 
project. Every Ed Brubaker, Sean Phillips joint has been colored by Jacob Phillips all the way up to their upcoming one, Houses of the Unholy, which hits shops on August 14th. And Lisa, we love all Brubaker and Phillips comics. We do. We do. They're like granola. They're like sweet and crunchy, but sometimes they cut the inside of your mouth. <laughs> yeah, uh, I love that metaphor. I would not have chosen it myself, but I like it. Thank you. Uh, however, I do feel like Jacob Phillips has transformed the experience of reading Brubaker and Phillips's comics. There is an expressionism to them that was absent before, and now... I just feel like I emotionally engage with them in a far more intense fashion. Yeah, they're extremely evocative. And then paired with Sean Phillips' art, it makes you feel like what you feel when you read a Richard Stark Parker novel. It's like, it's like, it's not just, it's, it's the vibes. Yeah, like uh, to me, it captures the emotions of a noir and not necessarily the visuals of yes, a noir. Yes, yes. And since Jacob Phillips colored my heroes have always been junkies, he's gone on to illustrate that Texas blood with Chris Condon. He did the Enfield gang massacre. He's been on the podcast several times before. And when we saw Father's Day coming up, we were like, aha, <laughs> it would be great to get these two on the podcast to have a conversation that I don't think has been documented before. And we thought it was impossible but thankfully, these two guys are super cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we talk a lot about process. We talk about their origin story. Uh, we get into the nitty gritty of my heroes have always been junkies. We talk a little pulp as well. I try to get them to say nasty things about each other <laughs> and it doesn't work. Well, I mean, but we, we get some interesting psychology here. I'm, yeah. I'm very excited to share this conversation with our listeners. But before we do that, Lisa, we need to do some... Referrals. Sponsored by Omnibus. Omnibus is a modern digital comic book store and reader app carrying your favorite single issues, volumes, and omnibuses all day and date. Just like your local comic book store, you pay per book, but digital. Their focus is on building an excellent customer shopping and reading experience and using novel discovery features to help fans find their next new favorite book. They feature top tier content and already have many of the top publishers in comics today. So in the spirit of helping people find their next new favorite book, we have our referrals segment. The idea is to give our counselees, that's you guys, further reading on the themes of the episode. Think of it as us sending you to specialists to further your healing journey through comic books and you have access to omnibus whether you have an android or an iphone or just a browser a comic book store is waiting for you you can dive in right now you can even subscribe to comic books you can create a pull box on omnibus right now i'm gonna go first because i'm going to specially dedicate <laughs> this referral to Sean Phillips. I have some <laughs> comics that he really should be reading. Starting with That Texas Blood by Christopher Condon and Jacob Phillips. Particularly issue number 20. It is the Christmas special, but it also makes an excellent Father's Day special. And then, once he's completed that, this is not necessary to read both, but if you're Sean Phillips, you probably should. Um, the Enfield Gang Massacre by Christopher Condon and Jacob Phillips. I think these are necessary for Sean Phillips to read. No judgment, just putting it out there. All sons seek words of affirmation from their father. That's right. And guess what? Fathers, as we learn, also seek words of affirmation from their sons. Obviously, I love those books. I love how those books became great comic book couples counseling episodes with Jacob Phillips and Christopher Condon. And I am going to stick on that theme, Lisa. I'm going to recommend Newburn from Chip Zdarsky and Jacob Phillips. And I know I have recommended Newburn Volume 1 in the past, but Volume 2 just dropped and and it is the finale of the New Bern saga. It is an excellent crime noir -y story. If you like Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips books, you're definitely going to like New Bern as well. The title character is a private investigator, but what sets him apart from other private investigators is that he works for the crime families of New York. 
And the first volume pits Newburn against several of those crime factions and they turn on each other and we see murder and we see arson and we meet corrupt politicians. And as a result of what goes down in the first volume, that crime family, those crime factions turn against Newburn and his protege, Emily, has to come to the rescue. Ooh. I love crime. It is one of my favorite sub-genres. Plots and schemes. And we've yet to really cover it on the podcast yeah. because how would we do it? All of their relationships are going badly, so oh. <laughs> it should be very natural. I've always wanted to do a counseling session with the couple from Fatal. Ooh, the, yeah. The uh, Brubaker and Phillips uh, series. I think that would make a great episode. Maybe like November, noir November, yeah, that, something like that. You know, we like a theme. We like a theme here on Comic Book Couples Counseling. Uh, but those are our recommendations are referrals. Uh, both books are currently available on Omnibus, or actually, I think All we recommended... Books. Yeah, four, four books. All of them are available on Omnibus right now. Referrals! So let's go ahead and get into this conversation with Sean Phillips and Jacob Phillips. We don't really spoil anything plot-wise with any of the comics, but I do think if you have read My Heroes Have Always Been Junkies recently, it will enhance this conversation. Yeah. Or you can listen to this conversation, give us five stars, <laughs> leave a comment on Spotify, uh -huh. and then read the comic. That would also, and then you can listen to the comic, uh, listen to the comic, the conversation again on a different platform. We'd really appreciate it. And what I ended up doing was having this conversation and then going and reading My Heroes Have Always Been Junkies, Bad Weekend, Pulp, Night Fever, Where the Body Was, and also Houses of the Unholy, because we got a chance to read it early. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's all dark. What a weird week, but great. I am really into Houses of the Unholy. It's about satanic panic and, and the idea that Memories can become implanted, and then every time you remember the past, it's like your memories are made of butter, and they melt, and you leave your fingerprints all over them. It just reminds me how messy and malleable the past truly is. I'm a little young to remember Satanic Panic, but all of those documentaries are coming <laughs> back, and it really fascinates me, and it reminds me how... Um, ephemeral our stories are. Yeah, yeah. I enjoyed it as well. I loved Where the Body Was too. Uh, I'm aching to get back to the Reckless universe. Yeah. Uh, but they're also doing a great job of tantrically teasing <laughs> the return of Reckless. Of course, they just announced through Ed Brubaker's newsletter that they are going back to the criminal world, but in this new original graphic novel format. That's extremely exciting. That book is going to come out in early 2025, just in time for the new criminal Amazon Prime series starring Charlie Hunnam. That's super cool, too. So, yeah, it's a great time to be a fan of Jacob Phillips, Sean Phillips, and Ed Brubaker. And crime. Jake and Sean, welcome to Comic Book Couples Counseling. Hello. Hello. Hi, how you doing? This is exciting. We've never had a father-son team on the podcast before. My question is for Sean. How relieved okay. were you when you found out that your son not only had artistic aspirations, but he has actual talent? Because I can imagine <laughs> it being terrible going like, oh, no, I hope my boy's got it. Yeah. I mean, he's always been good at drawing, obviously. But, um, yeah, to find out he could actually do it was definitely a relief. One of the first things Jake did for Ed and I on our comics was do, do some color vid for us on My Heroes Always Been Junkies. And I knew Jake could do it, but Ed was really relieved he could actually do it. <laughs> Jake, yeah, from and, your point of view, I know you kind of fell into making comics. You were into illustration before <laughs> you finally accepted this medium as a, a viable art form for you. Um, yeah. was there ever any hesitation going into My Heroes Have Always Been Junkies? Um, not really, because I needed the money. Mm. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, like, uh, Dad did the first, like, I think two pages of it and sent me a, and sent me a file with a, with a palette of, I think, 12 colours on it or something. Yeah, um, maybe. Or nine colours, something like that. I was like, this is what I'm thinking use these 
and sort of gave me very strict parameters to work in, so I couldn't really mess it up too badly, <laughs> which is which was quite a nice like entry point. I think like it was sort of eased me into coloring, and then I had to figure out how to do it properly then on the next. But no, it was like I wasn't too worried about it particularly. It was just sort of another job. Like I, I had already been working for a few years doing illustration jobs, so I sort of had the had that side of it sort of was fine. And Sean, you had a very like specific uh, color philosophy that you wanted to execute on My Heroes Have Always Been Junkies. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's right. Um, I was originally going to color the book myself um, because it didn't seem right to ask a colorist to do it in a very specific way. And then I ran out of time, so that's why Jake did do it. But um, yeah, I wanted to look like um, British 1960s romance comics. My first comics job was drawing comics aimed at young girls in the early 80s. And Brit- at the time then, British comics weren't in full colour. You'd get you know, um, black and white and maybe a colour. you get colour cover, but it wouldn't be full colour. You'd get like three or four colours maybe. So I wanted to do something that e- echoed that a little bit. Um, partly because, and the reason we did the Junkies book in the first place, because I wanted Ed to write me a romance book. Because mm. I wanted to try and um, revisit that sort of subject matter in my more mature drawing style as opposed to how I used to draw when I was 15 and 16 when I first started. So that was part of it as well. And also I wanted to make it easy for myself and I was going to color it myself as well. Mm. And, you know, that book to this day, stand apart from the rest of your work, Jake, I know you had the restrictions of those 12 palettes, but what was the experience of actually executing it? Um, it was pretty straightforward. Like I got, it's interesting because it, you're sort of dealing with color in a different way to how you normally would. Because there's no sort of local color on anything. It's all done in. It's in the sort of the, the modeling and the shading aspect of it. And then you just sort of choose colors within that which look nice. Like there wasn't much thought as to like, oh, well, that needs to be green because it's grass or anything like that. Which kind of, uh, I think, frees you up a lot. And that went into doing more traditional color work later on, keeping that same mindset of, oh, it doesn't have to be, the sky doesn't have to be blue, the grass doesn't have to be green. People don't have to be sort of skin color. It can all be whatever, as long as it works within the um, within the world that you've made and the, and the scene that you, you're coloring. So it's actually quite a good way to get started, I think. You don't get too bogged down in what the right color is. You get, it's more about creating the, the right image. I was going to say, uh, also, that particular book, um, I drew it with no black work on it. It was just lines. The only black was like a black T-shirt or something like that, or I didn't put any modelling on the faces like I usually do. Usually my stuff has a lot of um, black shadows on it, but I didn't have any of that. So Jake had to de- decide all that for himself. He had to you know, think of where the light source was and, and you know how to model a face or, or whatever. So you know, that made it doubly difficult, I think. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like since, uh, Jake, you came on board as colorist, the, the the collaboration, like all the Brubaker Phillips books, feel like they've taken on a much more like metaphorical coloring uh, concept. You know, the colors really do drive the emotions of the books in a way that maybe they didn't in the past. At least that's like my reading experience. Um, uh, well, yeah. Go ahead, Jake. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, it's less important to me what the right color is and it's more about setting the tone. And that comes like before everything else, I think. And so, and also just like making a cool looking image. You know, it's like, <laughs> it, it, otherwise it, it can just look like anything else or a bit sort of basic looking, especially with I, my, the way that I, I color. Think is quite sort of um, broad, and I'm not I'm not doing any sort of like fancy technical stuff. It's all quite like straightforward and big shapes and quite loose modeling and all that sort of stuff. So it makes sense to do a sort of more expressive color palette as well to match that, and also it hides that I'm not very good at all the other stuff. Yeah, I mean I don't give Jake any direction on any of the stuff we do nowadays. Since Junkies, I just leave him to it. No, who knows. <laughs> If it's daylight or nighttime or whatever, you know, just leave it to him. I know not to do brown. Ed doesn't like brown. Oh, yeah, Ed doesn't like brown, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's, I, at the beginning, I did tell Jake what I do like in colour, um, or more what I don't like, really. I don't like over stuff. I don't like airbrush. I don't like 
um, where all looks like it's made out of um, silk or something. You know, I like it to look rougher and more painterly, I suppose, um, which suits my artwork anyway, because my the line work isn't very slick. You know, I, um, it makes it hard to colour because there's never any um, – the lines don't join up, so there's there's no areas to fill easily, you know, so that makes it difficult as well. And just like I wanted colour that sort of, uh, sort of matched it, I suppose. Yeah, you look at, like, uh, my heroes have always been junkies. The colours will, like, break out beyond the lines. You know, it's not about – like getting in there like a a fifth grader making sure that you color all inside the lines it's the colors are explosive beyond your line work sean yeah yeah i think as well that's sort of like a lot of that sort of uh mid-century illustration stuff where it's things don't quite match up or it intentionally goes outside the line there's someone like uh, greg smallwood on um the sort of similar thing on human target where it's sort of it's uh a more stylized version of what of similar stuff to what I do on on the colors, where it's yeah, like big shapes, and they don't necessarily make exact sense in the real world, and yeah, it goes outside the line and all that sort of stuff. And also, Jake isn't trained as a colorist, so I give I gave him the, the DC Comics um, guide to coloring book, but I don't think you've ever even opened it, have you, Jake? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, he doesn't know the right way of doing it as far as comics coloring goes. He's approaching it purely from a a more illustrative or fine art direction. Jacob, do you find that your dad's taste has guided or driven your taste? Or do you ever just feel like a wild hair and you're like, ah, can't wait to use the F out of an airbrush machine or whatever? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think, well, I think we like a lot of the same stuff anyway. Um, I'm sure that's to do with growing up in a house full of artwork that looks a certain way and that's, you know, we read a lot of the same comics, we like a lot of the same eyes. Um, but sometimes, like, the whole, like, yeah, avoiding the airbrush stuff, but there has been a lot more airbrush stuff in the later ones, but, like, really big, like, use it as a, as a broader gradient on stuff, mm -hmm. um, which I don't mention. I just sort of see if I can slip it in and no one says <laughs> Yeah. Oh, well, I'll have, to, I'll have to take a closer look. <laughs> yeah, obviously not. Next time. Time. Yeah. So, Sean, you've been working with Ed Brubaker since 2008. And so you clearly know, like, the value of a good creative partnership, or at least what you are looking for in a creative partnership. Yeah. Like, what lessons have you learned about finding or being a good partner in a project? Oh, uh, I, I mean, I was already a fan of Ed's stuff before we started working together. I mean, that's I'm, helpful. I'm, yeah. I read Low Life when that was coming out in the mid '90s, maybe was it something like yeah. that? Um, and when he started working for Vertigo, I was also working for Vertigo at the time, so I saw his stuff anyway. And we started working together 1999, actually, um, on Scene of the Crime. Mm. And you know, I, I was a fan. And when it came around to do more stuff together, yeah, why not? It was it was great to have someone whose stuff I liked, and he liked my stuff. Only work with each other nowadays. Um, for me, mostly, uh, yeah, 2006, I think it was when we started Criminal. So. You know, I've not really done anything else with any other writers. You know, I like his stuff. He lets me get on with it. He, you know, I he does the draw, he does the words, and I do the drawings, and that's as easy as that. You know, so we keep it out of each other's way. I think we both trust each other to do the best. You know, and we haven't got any outside interference now. We don't have any an editor. We don't have to, um, you know, stop to do a crossover with another comic that month or any of that sort of stuff. You know, we can do whatever we like. We we can choose the paper stock, the format, the frequency, um, the subject, everything. You know, so. There's, there's no reason to go anywhere else, definitely. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're, I'm lucky. Well, we're both lucky we found each other, I suppose. So a lot of your satisfaction comes out of, like, the autonomy of getting to make your own decisions, artistic decisions? Oh, yeah, definitely, yeah. I mean, I have to think about the reader a little bit in the back of my mind, but mm -hmm. I don't let it get in the way. You know, I, I do I – want, I want Ed to like what I do. And if he likes it, then that's that's a good start. And then if other people like it as well, that's good too. But yeah, I think, yeah, it'd be hard to give up that control. Definitely now. I'm, I'm really used to it. And Jacob, are you the same way? Are you like, <laughs> hey, just give me space and I'll do my thing? Yeah, pretty much. And like, as now that we do these, uh, you know, two books a year, graphic novels, I don't do anything pretty much until like the last two weeks before you go to the printers because I'm doing my own stuff. <laughs> Mm -hmm, yeah, of course. And that's got like worse and worse as we've gone through, I think. I used to keep up a little <laughs> bit and now I don't keep up at all. So it's like 
if they don't trust me to do it, then they'll be very worried, I think, sitting there waiting for the pages to come. Yeah, I, I think Ed's worried every time. Ed always thinks you're going to blow the deadlines. Yeah. But you never do, but, so... Yeah, yeah, I always hit it. It's just, yeah. I know exactly how many pages I can do in a week. So I can, I know how long it's going to take me to do it. Yeah, so that I'm sort of, they can't make any changes because I, they haven't got time. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They've got, they yeah. get what they've given. I feel like there is so much romance and a creative partnership and like finding someone you actually genuinely admire and enjoy working with is something that is so extraordinarily special you know and rare and rare and like the yeah. idea of i like the quality of having to communicate less like a lot of times you know you relationships are about communication but sometimes it's just like okay but what do you trust me to not what do i not need communicated <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean as far as this you know ed's writing goes he knows exactly how much information to give me in a script i'd like to think i surprise him sometimes but i think he mostly knows what he's going to get um not in a bad way i hope um I hope, yeah, I hope sometimes it does surprise him, but you know, he he knows to give me just enough. And if, and if I'm unsure about anything, I can always ask him for more you know, direction if I wanted it. But are you looking for words just, of affirmation? Are you looking for Ed to just like go like, man, you really nailed it this time? Um, yeah, whenever I send, I mean, I send him pages every, every couple of days. Um, the, the last couple of weeks, I've just been penciling, so I've been pe sending four pages every day. And if I don't get an email within a couple of hours asking, you know, saying they're great. I want to know why. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, I know why. It's because he's working on a TV show and he's very busy. So, you know, sometimes uh, sometimes it may take him a couple of days to get back to me. But, yeah. Yeah, of course, yeah. I mean, I tell him I like the script and he tells me he likes the drawings and that's that's good enough, you know. Obviously, Jake loves what we do as well. Uh -huh. I think Jake. If I read it, I'm sure I'd like it. <laughs> <laughs> Jacob, do you need that? Do you need affirmations? Like when you send pages to your dad and to Ed, are you, are you looking for a pat on the back? Um, usually I get a text at the end of it saying, oh, good nice. job. Nice. <laughs> or, like, Ed, sometimes Ed emails me about halfway through saying, oh, it's looking really good, this one. But that's about it. Because I don't send, I, it just goes up onto the Dropbox folder as I do it. So I'm not like sending, I'm not actually sending anything. It's just, it's just there. Uh -huh. um, so I don't expect a reply whenever I send in pages each day. Um, I'll reply but, yeah. if I notice you've sent any. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Normally it's so, like, yeah, looks good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can tell oh, you face to face. Well, so <laughs> the payment is the reward. Ooh, yeah. And I'm sure that's also a thrill. <laughs> I'm a musician and I find like, you know, I'm a musician when I'm doing my music, but I find that I I apply my musicianship to so many areas of my life. I feel like a musician quality that I have is like I'm punctual. Like I'm 15 minutes early. Guess what? I'm here. And that's something I learned from being a musician. Do you find that there are things about being an artist or having an artist's eye that apply to other areas of your life? Oh, I think it applies to everything. You know, um, you can't watch a movie or a TV show without thinking, oh, that composition's good. That, the way they lit that, those color choices. Walking in someone's house, you can't help but think, oh, I like the color of that wall or whatever. Well, you just, you know, you're just visually aware of everything. And it all feeds into the work subconsciously, I suppose. But um, yeah, you can't help it. Uh, yeah, I think it's the same. I think you can't switch off that part of your head, really. It's all, and also, you, I'm constantly looking for ideas to steal from wherever I can steal them. Um, like reading, reading comics, yeah, but also, yeah, watching films, watching TV shows, that kind of thing. Or just like, on like photography and things like that, like trying to steal stuff from as many as broader places as you can. Otherwise, if you're only stealing from comics, it's going to be noticed a lot quicker. I think. Does it influence Definitely, anything yeah. that you do? Like, I, like as a musician, you know, I go like I'm a person who practices, and it doesn't matter what I'm doing. Like, if I am crocheting, I practice like a musician. If I have, uh, you know. If I have to do some public speaking, like I practice like a musician practices. Do you, do, if are you they, do an interview, you practice. I practice like a musician <laughs> practices. So like, do, are there things that you do that are not art, but you do in an artist's way? Um, not me. I, I don't do anything else. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Jake's got yeah, a much more rounded life. Yeah, but I don't know if I approach it. I don't know. I don't know how other people do things. Like mm -hmm. I've always like, there probably is, but I wouldn't notice because it's just the way that I do everything. But no, not oh, I don't know. Nothing springs to mind, but probably. I, I, I guess it, you can't help but do everything the way that you do it. And this is what I spend, you know, 
eighty percent of my time doing. So it must, yeah, I assume it influences everything that I do. Yeah, but we do know that you're both movie maniacs, and you've both now done work for the Criterion Collection, the Lone Star uh, Blu-ray. I'm very excited to pick up Jake. Uh, one of my favorite John Sayles movies. Uh, and and I do see a cinematic influence in both of your work. Um, like, how important is that art form to what you do? Um, yeah, I mean, I watch a lot of films. Like, I go to the cinema every, at least once a week. I watch probably, you know, four or five films every week. So I think you can't help but soak it all in. And it's I can read, I can watch a lot more films than I can read comics. I get a much broader sort of input from that as well and I can watch you know I can watch one an hour like I watched two films on Sunday because I had nothing else to do I sat around after doing a long walk on Saturday so it's um yeah I mean I think it can't help but infiltrate what you're doing and you know before I was doing professional work I was doing fan art of films that I was watching so doing things like the Criterion covers is like exactly what I'd be doing I've actually got a Criterion a fake Criterion cover that I made I think in when well, I would have been about uh, fifteen or sixteen in school for a film that I made up, and it's like sat with over there. I've got like a, all my DVD covers that I've done, and that sat in that collection. Um, oh man! So I, I was doing it, you know, fifteen years before I actually did a Criterion cover. That's so fun. Can we see it? You're gesturing in a direction. Go grab it. Um, I think um, yeah, film is a big thing, definitely, um, but. I don't think it influences me directly necessarily. Growing up, um, you know, there'd be a black and white film on TV on a Sunday afternoon. I think that sort of stuff gets in your head, the way that stuff is lit. I, I think about the light a lot in my comic work, but maybe that comes from film, but you don't really get films lit like that anymore, you know, like yeah. an old 40s or 50s movie. So, um, But like Jake said before, the, that mid-century illustration style, that's a, more of an influence, I think, probably. The clothes were better, the cars were better, you know, the haircuts were better. Uh, all that stuff. <laughs> okay, Jacob, let's see it. There you go. Oh, yeah. that's pretty Sign of the moon. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're about 15, I think, when you did that. I think so, yeah. And it's got like the. Oh, I've broken the case. It's, oh, no! There you go. It's got like a little booklet thing in there as well. Oh, my God. Stuff. That's amazing. Uh, like the yeah. full... <laughs> Wow. And it's fully illustrated. Yeah. It was a school project, though, wasn't it? It was a school project, yeah. Did you get an A? Oh, probably. Probably. <laughs> that yeah. is really really cool thank you for sharing that with us that's so fun i was gonna say i, say, I, lo I love doing the dvd covers I, I do you know um i've done about 12 13 maybe for criterion and some which are always sort of um prestigious films usually something you've heard of whereas jake and i both work for arrow as well and some other other labels and it's it's more it's less well-known stuff more low budget stuff more genre stuff so yeah. it's always fun to you know flex those different muscles. We have um, a few of your prints from Arrow hanging in the office for the Hired Hand and Friday Foster. Oh right, yeah, yeah, cool, good yeah. stuff. Yeah, the Hired Hand was a nice one to do. Yeah, to get to do a Western type thing. I think that was one of the things that was a big influence on doing Pulp the book I did with Ed because we did that because I asked him to write me a Western because I'd been drawing a lot of cities, a lot of cars and stuff like that, and I wanted to draw something a bit different. You know, I wanted to do you know, some wide open landscape. And stuff like that, but we didn't. He didn't actually write any of that in there. And most of it was set in the 30s, so I sort of had to draw builders and cars as well, <laughs> and horses and hats and guns, all the things I don't like drawing. Sean, what did your parents do, and did what they do influence how you do what you do? My my parents just had normal jobs. You know, my dad worked in an office. My mom, um, you know, she looked after the kids mostly, but she did occasionally work. But they, my dad had artistic ability, but he never had the opportunity to, to do anything with it. Um, I wouldn't say uh, they'll never listen to this, obviously, but um, they were encouraging enough, but not. It was hard to wrap their for them to wrap their heads around the fact that you could actually get a job doing art. You know, that just seemed like a stupid idea. No one ever gets to do that. Um, and it wasn't until I was quite well established that my dad actually realised that it is a real job. You know, um, and they have to treat it like a real job as well. You know, it, it took a while. I mean. Because I started so young, I was still at school when I was drawing comics. And it was just a hobby. It was just for fun. So it, it, I, never, I never took it very seriously until I left art college when I was, how old was I then? 23. You know, so, um, and I just sort of fell into it a bit like Jake did as well. 
Uh, it just sort of took over. I, I thought I'd be a regular illustrator when I left art college. I did graphic design at college. And um, the comics just, they're big jobs. You know, even one comic takes a month at least. Whereas if you do, you know, a DVD cover or whatever, that's a couple of days work. And then you've got to go and find another job and then another one and another one. So the comics sort of take up a lot more time and, um, yeah, just sort of, and pushes out everything else. The stuff I do outside of comics, I never go looking for it. It always comes to me because I never feel there's the time to do that sort of stuff. And I, and I don't always, sometimes I turn stuff down or recommend Jake sometimes to do stuff and I haven't got the time to do it. But um, yeah, mostly it's just the comics, isn't it? Did but you yeah. get... Did you get a lot of satisfaction being able to enthusiastically encourage Jacob and and give him the encouragement you felt like you didn't have as a kid? Uh, Yeah. Um, (laughs) I don't know. I I mean, I'm glad he's doing it. That means, you know, we've got something in common we can talk about. And, um, but if he'd want to do something else, that would have been fine too. I mean, his brothers don't do anything artistic. His older brother's a master of physics. What does Fred do, Jake? I don't know. He does, does something to do with computers. Does something to do with maths and computers and stuff. <laughs> so, you know, it's something we don't understand. But yeah, I mean, I'd, hopefully I'd encourage all my kids to do something they like. I wouldn't put them off it thinking that's you know not a good way to make a living because I'm proof that, you know, you can make a living anyhow. You know? Better to do something you like, isn't it? Jake, and now you have to respond to that. Was that all true? <laughs> no, it's all lies. He was like, go and get a proper job. <laughs> no, I think, yeah, like I was never, I think sometimes, yeah, because, you know, sometimes when we do, I do the interviews with Alan, people say, they know, like, oh, um, do you think, do you think you were, you know, sort of more likely to do this kind of thing because of what my parents do? And I think it's mostly just, yeah, I was never discouraged from doing it. Whereas I think most people are, you know, most children draw and then they're told not to draw. Or that it's sort of pushed aside for doing some, yeah, a proper subject at school and then go to university and do something of making some money. You now, I have friends that have got jobs and offices, but they hate it because they knew that they would go and make some money doing that, doing that. And then they spend that money doing what they actually like to do, whereas I get to spend my day doing what I actually like to do. And that makes sense. So it's a very fortunate position to be in. But I think, yeah, I was just never discouraged from doing any of that stuff. I think you know, I know you were sorry you were discouraged a little bit by the fact that you see me do it. You know, yeah. it's long hours. You know, it's only in the last I don't know three or four years maybe that I don't that I don't work weekends anymore. Whereas when Jake was growing up, most weekends I'd be working. Most I'd be working late at most nights, and you know, it's a lot of work goes into making a comic. So I think that might it might put you off of doing comics specifically, but illustration yeah. in general. Yeah, that's fine. I would love to know how your collaboration has evolved since my heroes have always been junkies. Like when you get to your latest project, Houses of the Unholy, what is that like versus what it was like to do your first collaboration? Um, I think the difference now is that I let Jake do what he likes. You know, for the junkies book, it was very prescriptive what I wanted. But now, just leave him to it. Is that right, Jake? Yeah. I think so. Um, yeah, and usually now I go in with some kind of idea of what I want to do differently to what I did on the last, but I don't necessarily make that known. I just sort of do it. And it it's, it's very slight changes that most people probably wouldn't even notice when they read the books. But it's the same thing I do when, I, when I'm drawing my own books as well. I, each time I change it up slightly. Mm. But, um, you might be able to tell if you have them side by side, but you probably wouldn't necessarily notice if you just pick the next one. Um, mm. But yeah, I don't necessarily tell that or... Ed, that I'm going to do these things. And I don't know if they even notice that I'm doing them anyway. Um, no, it all looks, the, all looks the same to me. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the same with the drawing now i try to make each job different to the one before but yeah i mean to the untrained eye you probably can't tell the difference uh, so is there oh, oh. an emotion or an element of houses of the unholy that is driving the art your artistic expression i mean i made some rules up at the beginning um just to make it different from the one before so every page is full bleed there's a lot more black on the pages much more claustrophobic feeling i think because of that that's the only thing i would really changed i didn't i specifically tried to make the main character look a lot different to how i usually would draw somebody you start off with those intentions and they last for the first few pages then it all sort of like goes back to how you always did stuff uh, so i don't know Oh, no, I didn't really. The script always just makes you know tells you what to do, gives me ideas on what how to approach stuff. But um, I don't really yeah think about it that much anymore. Just mm. get on with it. I need to know what they're um, what they're doing before I can decide on stuff. I never do character sketches before, and um, I'll draw the first ten pages with rough figure work, and I need to know what they're having to do to make to know how they're going to act and what they look like. And hopefully that might also influence Ed a little bit into what the how he writes the characters once once he's seen them. But yeah, I don't don't have that many um preconceived ideas about with anything before I start. How about you, Jake? Is like I know you're 
a little you get the you have to get it done at the tail end of the project so you got a more of a deadline base maybe maybe you feel that deadline more uh but with like houses of the unholy was there something about that script or or sean's art that uh, drove the color uh palettes i don't think so it, i tend to go into it you know based on like a scene by scene basis i don't go through the book beforehand really or read the script beforehand i have the script up whilst i'm working on the pages you know sometimes there's a little note from ed saying the color should be whatever but mostly it's just like is what's the light source is it day or night where are they and then after that it's just sort of up to me and what I think would work well for the scene. But sometimes it's, you know, with um, where the body was, that was quite a departure from night fever because obviously, well, they're, they're literally night and day. So I had to figure out how to colour sunny California or wherever it's set, you know, in the summertime and make that look good and not just sort of like quite straightforward and basic, which is, and it's the almost the opposite of what we did in the book before, which is all nighttime, you know, artificial light and, that sort of stuff um so that sort of dictates everything that i do going forward so like in um i had to find a way in where the body was to sort of that's why i started using these sort of grainy airbrushes to make everything sort of a bit hazy looking because that sort of fit the feel and and the story so things like that really dictated but in terms i don't know with this latest one it is sort of it's, it, mostly it's like at night time or gray overcast days which are probably the, my favorite things to my favorite things to call my least favorite thing to call is sunny daytime. So, um, but yeah, I think it's hard to. I think maybe we're, I haven't been back and looked at it really yet. So I think at the further you get away from it, the more you realize what it is that you did before. I don't go into it really with much of a plan. Jake's plan is the deadline. Uh. Yeah. Do you wish that he would start sooner? If you want to open up to him uh, and really tell him to change what he needs to do, we'd love to have no, him on our podcast. No, I, don't, I mean, no, it doesn't. But I know he's going to get it done. Yeah. You know, um, like he says, he knows how many pages he can color a week. But, you know, if something happened one day and he couldn't, it'd be nice that there's a bit more cushion in it. But <laughs> I'm not much better because I'm still finishing drawing it when he's col- when he started coloring. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I probably finished drawing it two days before the colors need to be finished because the deadlines are always zooming towards you, aren't they? So, um, yeah, I mean, in an ideal world, I'd have all the script before I started drawing as well, but that's never happened either. Mm-hmm. And then Jake would have all the pages drawn before he starts coloring, but that doesn't happen either. So, you know, and then we'd have, you know, a month at the end, maybe where we could fine tune it all before it went to the printers, but we don't have that time either. And yeah, it seems to get worse and worse every book. Sometimes you make a decision early on thinking that it won't really matter then it turns out that book is full of these things so it's like when i do sort of those flashback pages and it's i set a color palette for the, the flashback to depend on the yeah. thing and sometimes like oh i wish i hadn't done that on, on that you know that one page flashback or one panel flashback and now i've got to do it for 15 pages in a row and it looks mm. terrible <laughs> <laughs> it looks great jake oh thanks i don't there wasn't right. a specific thing but uh <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i mean it's the same with drawing the stuff you know it'd be nice if i knew that that particular location or that particular character might be coming back later or if they're not even better you know because then i won't waste my time making it look wonderful if it's only ever going to be for one page but sometimes in the scripts ed does say this person's important they're coming back later or this location is important that's coming come back later as well so make sure you draw it properly um <laughs> but yeah yeah don't usually have the luxury of that yeah i i I find it so fascinating the urgency with which most comics are made. They're always like a <laughs> scramble to the finish. Yeah. And I, I wonder, like, would you like to make a comic in an ideal world? Like where it's like you get to spend all of the luxurious time you need and and you get to wait. Uh, like, could that happen? Like, could if in a perfect world, could the ideal comic happen? And would that be as satisfying as the scramble or as good or as good as the scramble? Um I don't think it'd be any better necessarily. Mm-hmm. I think having deadlines forces you to make the decisions rather than. I mean, I never um, redraw anything. You know, mm-hmm. always what goes down goes down, and that's it. Unless I've done something wrong, misunderstood the script or whatever, then I might have to redraw a panel maybe. But the, the luxury of having you know, multiple goes at something doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be any better. I don't think. I like having a deadline. And I like the urgency of it, but sometimes it'd just be nice to have that extra couple of weeks maybe. Uh, I mean, I've done a couple you of. Um, sorry. You need to have yourself a fake deadline, 
and then oh yeah, well that's why. Earlier. Yeah, well I always tell Ed the fake deadline because he never yeah. he never keeps track of any of this stuff. So I just tell him it has to be done by now. He goes okay then, and then because I know I know you won't meet that. So um, the real <laughs> deadline, I never tell Ed that stuff. What about Jake? What do you think about a perfect world comic where you have all the time in the world? Do you have a desire to work slow? Well, at the moment I'm I'm, I'm just about to finish up on this Fabian Novel Megalopolis, which I've been working on since I think I think it's been 18 months and the first 12 months I drew about 30 pages so and now, I've got draw, and now I'm drawing it four pages you know uh, I'm doing about 10 pages a week so I don't think it matters I think I would just I'd, I'd do other stuff until the deadline mm -hmm. if I had two yeah. years to do, to do a book I'd do another book in the middle because mm. um, <laughs> yeah yeah I'm not going to spend any more time on those pages if anything I spend too much time on them as it is uh, and, that, and I don't spend any time at all really uh, compared to other artists, um, I think it takes me as long as it takes me to draw a page. So it's not going to, you know, if I only drew one page a day rather than two pages a day, then I just spend more time on Twitter in between. <laughs> it's, it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't, I wouldn't spend, or I'd go home earlier. Like, there's no, there's no scenario where I'd be like, oh, well, I've got a whole day. I'll really take my time and make it all fiddly and detailed. It's just not what I'm interested in. So I wouldn't, I don't think it would make any difference at all. Yeah, but it, might same. Nice, I mean, it might be nice to work less. It'd be nice to have a bit more thinking time and a bit more research time. Because I started drawing copies before the internet, it used to be even harder then, you know, to find out what something looked like. But now you can Google everything, obviously. So, but even then, it still takes a massive, probably takes a third of my day if I've got something difficult to draw, which is most things. Because most of my, most of my books are set in America and I've hardly ever been there. And I don't really know what it looks like. You can see behind me, this doesn't look like an American house. So, right. you, know, um, you know, everything has to be researched. So either having a research, research assistant, which would be really nice, or just have more time to find out what things look like. But the actual mm -hmm. drawing stuff, you know, like Jake says, you know how long it takes to draw. And you just, that's how long it takes to draw. I mean, I, you know, I've drawn you know, tens of thousands of pages and I don't know exactly how long it's going to take me. Well, yeah. Given how much we love your comics already, we don't want you to have any more extra time. We like uh, <laughs> all the constraints that you're suffering under right now. Well, thank you. Uh, definitely well, feels like it at the moment. It also forces you to make decisions on it, which I think is helpful. You can't yeah. overthink it or fap around and make it and overwork it. I think you know a lot of the artwork that I like on in other people's is quite well, seemingly straightforward. Um, yeah, effortless looking. Yeah, so you but don't want to you don't want to noodle around on it for hours and hours and make it mm. worse. I think mm. the the time restriction can be beneficial. I think, and also like even when it comes when it comes to coloring, it's the same. Right, I have to make fast decisions on it, and and um, you sort of the style comes from cutting the corners that you know you can cut. Uh, otherwise, everything would be shiny and perfect. You would lose a lot of the character. <laughs> when was the last time that you two disagreed on any aspect? of the comics making. Don't think we do, do we, Jay? It's never happened. Um, um well, I mean, I I don't I always like what Jake does on my stuff. As far as like the process, I wouldn't criticize Jake's comics that he draws to say, oh, I wouldn't do it like that. That never that would never happen. Jake wouldn't do it to me because he doesn't actually look at them. <laughs> you said uh, I think when uh the Enfield trade came out, you said that, that can go on the pile of books of yours I've not read. Yeah, it is it's still on the pile of books of yours I've not read, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's pretty it's good. Bio, though, Jake. We liked it a lot. I, I'm sure I it means first... a lot less coming from us. <laughs> <laughs> I read the first issue. That's because you drew Sorry, a cover. You, you drew a cover for it. You had to read it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you don't read my books either. I read the script. <laughs> you don't even read the script. You only read the, the panel <laughs> descriptions. You don't read the dialogue. Sometimes if it looks interesting, I read the dialogue. <laughs> yeah, Brad and I have a creative partnership. You know, we make the podcast together and we actually do a lot of things, creative things together. And that is the only thing we fight about. We never have those like usual couple fights of like, who's doing the dishes or whatever, whatever <laughs> other couples fight fight about where our fights are always like, I would never say it that way or you're not letting me be myself. It's always like that kind of stuff. Yep. Yep. That's what we find. But that's yep. the difference between a father-son relationship and a husband-wife relationship, yeah, yeah. maybe. I think if Jake and I still live in the same house, that would make it more difficult. Mm. I mean, we did for the beginning of lockdown, we shared a studio because Jake yeah. came home for that. Uh, lockdown was two or three, three months or something, was it? Yeah. Um, and I really enjoyed it having someone in the studio with me. Um, I didn't like because someone behind me going, no, I wouldn't do it like that. <laughs> <laughs> no. I never did that. Um, because I've never done it like that before. I haven't shared a studio with anybody since I was at art college. So, you know, I've always worked in a room by myself. So it was quite nice um, doing that. It would be better if we'd had two computers rather than just the one. But um, yeah, it's quite nice having, you know, 
someone's talking about. I mean, Jake's mum's a painter as well. So she she works, she's got a studio outside the house. So I don't even get to see her stuff that much. So she brings it home and tells me in detail why she did it. Fascinating it is. <laughs> mm, love it. Is what behind you is behind you is that's what is that hers, Sean? Yeah, that's one of hers, yeah. It's um yeah, flowers. She tends to paint either florals or landscape. We live in the Lake District in the north of England. It's all mountains and lakes and stuff. So she's got an amazing view out of her studio window of the ever-changing weather over the mountains and stuff. So she gets a lot of inspiration from that. Oh, well, we'll have to steal her for the next uh, Phillips conversation. <laughs> uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for hanging out and chatting with us. So uh, we'll let you back into the world because it sounds like you got to get back to making comics immediately. It's an emergency. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. And there you have it, our conversation with Sean Phillips and Jacob Phillips. Lisa, I love the moments in this conversation where they talk about words of affirmation and how they don't really need it from each other, but also clearly it seems like they definitely do. Yeah, nobody wants to ask for what they need. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not shy about telling Brad, like, it's the time. My love tank's low, but I guess between a father and son, that gets awkward. Yeah, I mean, I I, I, I definitely uh, a person who craves uh, words of affirmation, and we're very open about it. But when I was younger, I was always seeking it from my parents. And, I, you know, for the most part, I did get it, but sometimes I wouldn't. And then I'd be like, yo, you got to tell me that I'm good. You got to tell me I'm a good son. Oh, no. Like, so we just had, I had another student recital where all of my little music students get up on the stage and perform. Congratulations, Lisa. Thank you. Went and off without a hitch. They were so cute. And the microphones did not fit in the stands. <laughs> and that really, for my my peace of mind, really okay. was a wrench in the whole thing. So maybe there are a few hitches. <laughs> but I always end something like that by calling my parents because they come. They're extremely <laughs> supportive. They had to come to my piano recitals. Now they have to come to my students' piano recitals. <laughs> and um, I always ask for tons of feedback, all of which must be positive. <laughs> right, right, right. And you got it. I did. And you got it. Yeah, they know yeah. what I want. Yeah, and, and, and so clearly, you know, Jacob needs some words of affirmation, but also Sean needs some words of affirmation too. What's so interesting about this is now – they are acting as peers, which yeah. I imagine gets really messy and weird. Yeah, but, and so like either you have the choice of like digging in or stepping back and letting it breathe. And yeah. I feel like they do a good balance of both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I like how they both also look for Ed Brubaker to say nice things, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I also really enjoyed the aspect of this conversation that centered around the urgency in which comics are made. And how they wish it was different, but they wouldn't do it any other way. Exactly, yeah, yeah. And how, you know, maybe those constraints are what makes comics work. Yeah. Yeah. My temperament is definitely one who, like, I don't hit the gas until, like, oh, my goodness, the deadline is right around the corner. Well, I hate to break the news to you, Lisa, but we owe uh, somebody a script, a oh, comic no. script, <laughs> and we haven't started writing it yet, and we've got don't less than worry. two weeks. The last minute is when I do my best work, or at least I don't have any evidence to the contrary, because I've never started anything early. We're supposed to go on a little weekend getaway for our 15th wedding anniversary, and I have a feeling that we're going to be doing some comic book writing. Oh, I, that actually sounds really sweet and fun. We've it never does. we've never had an anniversary where we wrote a comic together i know it'd be it'd be pretty cool it'd be pretty cool um pots and panels everybody pots yeah. and panels a comic cookbook anthology coming to a shop near you real soon uh, be on the lookout on all our socials we're not going to be able to shut up about it uh, yeah once yeah. it's up and running uh, we're proud and we've done nothing yeah. we are going yeah. to be <laughs> insufferable <laughs> hey we signed the contract this week Pew, pew, pew. Yeah, very, 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 very excited. Uh, Vuvuzela. We really need a soundboard. Well, for that to happen, we need more people to join our Patreon. Pow, pow, power <laughs> wheels. Uh, comic Book Couples Counseling Patreon. Please uh, support us. $1 a month or $12 a year. But again, I hope everybody really enjoyed this conversation with Sean Phillips and Jacob Phillips. It's a conversation that you don't see anywhere else, I don't think. Uh, if you do, let me know because I would also like to engage with that interview, even if it's not from Comic Book Couples Counseling. But also don't jump ship, don't unsubscribe to Comic Book Couples Counseling because we have another epic episode coming at you next week 
we are talking to Jordan Bloom, Patton Oswalt, and Kyle Starks about the new Minor Threats spinoff series, Barfly. Yeah, and if you haven't, <laughs> I can't, how, uh, if you like, if you would like more child and parent action, there's a better way to say that. We have Matt Kent <laughs> and his mom, Margie Kraft Kent, coming on to talk about guilt frame. I did not know where she were going. And don't you regret it? Child parent action. I don't want any child parent action, Houses Lisa. of the unholy. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that conversation with Matt Kent and Margie Kraftkent is adorable. We've also done a lot of guesting on other people's podcasts. Go to the show notes of this episode and find the links. But right now you can listen to me on Wizards, the podcast guide to comics, talking about the 1999 Wizards X-Men special. Lisa and I guested on This Comic Cooks with Vactor, talking about X-Men 97 in totality. Lisa and I were also guests on the fan base press countdown to the Eisners. They're doing a series of YouTube episodes investigating the nominations. A lot of fun. We love what the fan base press yes. do. And Lisa and I both did episodes of the 2000 AD thrill cast. Lisa talked about Full Tilt Boogie and I talked about the Hell Trekkers. Those episodes have not dropped yet, but go ahead and subscribe to that podcast feed now. And you can still see us at the movies we are hosting Green Lantern at the Alamo Drafthouse Winchester on the 23rd at 4 o'clock. And I don't want to make Ryan Reynolds feel bad, <laughs> but there is plenty of room. <laughs> We've sold eight tickets, including the two of Ourselves. us. Ourselves, yes. Uh, I think uh, Lisa and I underestimated how much people loathe that movie. But hey, if you are a patron and you'd like to come, the ticket is is free. Yeah, for the patrons. And if you're not a patron, but you still want to see the movie, it's $7. Yeah. Yeah. And you could just join our Patreon for a dollar and we'll pay the other $6 yeah. for your ticket. Please, you know, <laughs> at, at the very least, you can eat a pizza in the dark. <laughs> like, I think there are some quality elements to Green Lantern. Mark Strong Sinestro is fantastic. Actually, like all the Lantern Corps stuff, I really like. I love Kilowog. It's not a perfect movie, but we don't need our movies to be perfect, people. Green Lantern is fun. And they serve drinks. You yeah. can order a cocktail <laughs> get, get and wasted. have a good time. Yeah, yeah. Get wasted. Get a mint julep and watch some Green Lantern. Okay, Brad, I'm thinking about my Father's Day, and I think I have some apologies to send as well. So <laughs> where can our listeners send their words of affirmation to you? You can find me on most social medias at Mouthdork. If you have words of affirmation for our logo, you can send them to Aaron Prescott at A Cool Hand Fluke. And if you have some words of affirmation for our radical banner art and show poster, send them to Karen Chap at Karen underscore X. Been fan. Lisa, where can our listeners send their words of affirmation to you? I'm always accepting words of affirmation at Sidewalk Siren on Instagram and Twitter. If you'd like to spend more quality time with us, you can subscribe to us on Podbean, Spotify, YouTube, Audible, Apple Podcasts, or whatever app you choose. We're everywhere. If you'd like to get exclusive, Ooh. you can join our Patreon, where you'll get more content, including weekly bonus episodes. <laughs> you said that fast. I'm good at talking. <laughs> like, So you're listening to this Sean Phillips, Jacob Phillips episode, but we've actually also dropped two other episodes just this week. One conversation with Jim Starlin and the other one with the Aspen Comics founder, co-founder, Frank Massamoro. Nice. Talking about Michael Turner and the Marvel art of Michael Turner and the legacy of that incredible talent. Uh, if you'd like to reach out and touch us electronically, you can email the podcast, cbccpodcast at gmail.com. You can visit our website, comicbookcouplescounseling.com, or follow us on all the socials at cbccpodcast. You can give us the gift of five stars on Apple Podcasts, and if you'd like to do an act of service, why not write a review of the show while you're there? Yes, please. We are fluent and receptive in all five love languages. It really warms our hearts and helps the pod. So until next time, friends, keep your love tank full. And your psychic rapport open. Doopy doopy. Bum, bum, ba, da, bum, bum, ba, da, ba. <laughs> Excuse me, my throat is making noises. Gross. I'm a human. I'm a meat puppet. Disgusting. <laughs>